Welcome to the Word Podcast. The Lord God has given us His Word. Let us learn it. Let us live it. Let us rejoice in it. Spread the Word. Blessings, everybody. This is Dale. Thank you so much for joining with me today on the Word Podcast. We're continuing our examination of Hebrews, and we're in the 12th chapter. You know, we're getting close to the end of the book. You know, we've had many, many episodes. Uh, I'm not sure how many, more than 100, I think, uh, as of right now. So we're in the 12th chapter, and we've seen the last couple of ex- uh, episodes that the author has set up a juxtaposition between two mountains, okay? Mount Sinai and what the... Uh, uh, children of Israel, the Hebrew people had experienced there, and what we as believers experience now. So let's re- reiterate that last part. Here's Hebrews 12, verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, <coughs> and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. You know, we we went back with Mount Sinai and and looked at Exodus 19 and part of Exodus 20 in relationship to that and what what happened with that event. We could do the same with this right here, looking forward toward Mount Zion, but it would take a long time, folks. (laughs) Because the scripture tells us a lot about it in Revelation and a lot of prophetic things. That these are things that we have come to. Some that we experience at the moment, okay? We experience at the sprinkling of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ of being uh, made righteous. But there's even more yet to come, okay? When we're gathered together with the general assembly, whether that means the church or if that means the divine beings with the church that are the human, the church of the firstborn, which are enrolled in heaven, regardless of what that means, that is yet to come. And so we could read much about that. It goes beyond the purview of this time, right? I just want us to see that what we have now is far, far better than what they had in the old covenant. Remember what Hebrews is all about, that Jesus is better. Yeah, that Jesus is better. So what's the conclusion of all this? Well, uh, chapter 12, verse 25 says this. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. So the author is saying, hey, you know, make sure that you're not refusing the one who's speaking to us, the one who has told us this. Why is that? Well, he continues in verse 25. For if those did not escape when they refused him, who warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. And there's any number of examples that we could give related to that. But remember the context right here, that God gave the word to Moses. Moses told the people, Moses warned the people, but they refused to listen to him. So Moses is the great example. So if they did not escape after being warned by Moses, if they didn't escape the things that happened here on earth, what makes us think that we're going to escape if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven, the Lord God himself? Now, verse 26, and his voice shook the earth then. Wow, see, that gives us more insight to the fact that it is Moses that's being spoken about. Remember what we saw in Exodus 19, how when he spoke forth, it shook the earth and it terrified the people? So 26, and his voice shook the earth then, but now, He has promised, saying, yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. That's a quote from the Old Testament. So he's bringing this, the author is bringing this quote in from the Old Testament to say, hey, this is what the Lord is saying. And this time when he comes, he's not going to shake just the earth, but also the earth and the heaven. Now, verse 27, this expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of, of those things which can be shaken as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. What? Well, l- let me read the last two verses and we'll talk about it a little bit. Therefore, oh, there's a term of conclusion. Since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, 
Let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Oh, now we've heard that before. We've heard that phraseology, that little part right there. But you see the context of it. He says, now what is this expression yet once more? That denotes, listen to this, the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Hmm. What is that talking about? Well, the bottom line is this. There's going to be a shaking that go. It's going to be coming. There's going to be a judgment. God's going to pour forth his wrath. There's going to be things that have been created which will be removed, which will be shaken. And these things will be shaken and will be removed. And in so doing, what will be revealed will be things that cannot be shaken. Now, it may be something that we can see within the natural, okay, because we know that the mountains and the seas and all these kind of things are undergo are going to undergo tremendous shaking. Okay, islands will disappear, the mountains will be brought down. All these things that you see related to what's going to happen when the Lord comes. We also know that there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, and a new Jerusalem, and a new city, <laughs> a new heaven and a new earth that will remain forever. In other words, which will not be shaken, which will not be done away with. And so the conclusion is this. Since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, so we know this stuff's going to happen in the natural, but we receive something, a transformed life that cannot be shaken. There's going to be a removal of things. Those that have not been transformed will be judged, will be shaken. Okay? But he says, we receive a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Since we have this, what should our response be? Let us show gratitude. Gratitude. Let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. You know, at, at the time of our recording right here, we're uh, a week out, a couple of weeks out. Yeah, two weeks from today, I think, is a Thanksgiving 2019. And, uh, you know, we always talk about giving thanks, giving thanks. But, you know, there's little places like this we see here that give us even more insight into that. That since we have received the kingdom, <coughs> since by faith and by belief we receive a kingdom, let us show gratitude. Now, who do we show gratitude unto? Who do we show graciousness unto? By which we offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. What is the acceptable service? Okay, what's the acceptable? It's what you see in Romans 12, perhaps. Okay, Offering yourself up as a living sacrifice. That this is the thing of giving of thanks and the way that we need to give thanks. It's one thing to thank the Lord for the things that he gives us, the blessings, this, that, that, that is needed. We must do that. But the ultimate giving of thanks is the giving of ourselves, is it not? And that we would do so in reverence and in awe. Anyway, end of chapter 12, verse Hebrews. Think about it, reflect upon it. Again, I'm Dale. Thank you so much for your time, and I'll see you in the next episode.